see some of what the Lord is doing through Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church and that is that satellite church that's now become independent Marathon Baptist Church down in the Keys and uh, they mentioned with great thankfulness to the Lord uh, your gift uh, financially to be able to get them into the where they are that storefront I guess and uh, just help with some things to jumpstart them and how you've been such a blessing and then how the prices especially have been a blessing and uh, it's just really really tremendous had a great attendance I wish I had the exact number but I don't so I'm not going to say I think it was a great attendance this morning I uh, didn't have anyone say this morning uh, but it did have some guests there and tonight is when they're actually signing the charter putting their names down and that's exciting uh, just a thrilling service and uh, because especially it's for me just two years ago uh, I did the same thing uh, for our church, home church in Tennessee. And uh, your pastor, Price, came up and uh, preached at our church. And uh, really, uh, we're very, very thankful for that. We're thankful for his heart for church planning and the burden to be able to get other churches started. And I appreciate you as a church uh, as well. I'm sure getting behind him and praying and supporting this effort to get other churches. We need more churches in this area, don't you agree? Yes. You don't, uh, uh, Pastor Price agrees with me, but anybody else? Uh, <laughs> uh, we all would agree. Yeah. We, we need more churches. And that's how God's plan works, is to be able to start more churches. And then they're good uh, satellite uh, soul winning stations. Uh, put one here, put one there, put one over here. And you could be able to reach this neighborhood and this community and this area over here. And God's plan is for that. And when we pray for America, let's pray that more churches would be started and that God would revive the ones that are in existence. Uh, it is it really is a great, uh, great to be here. Uh, as Pastor mentioned, uh, my family's uh, not all with me, uh, but I do have a prayer card with all our pictures, so I have proof that I have a family. Uh, not just Joseph. Joseph played the trumpet for, uh, for us tonight. He's our third born. Our first born's in North Carolina in college. Uh, our daughter's in Tennessee at a Bible Institute and our 12 year old is up in Deltona, Florida, just north of Orlando with my wife, Sherry, and uh, they're up there uh, during this weekend and, and uh, uh, we had a great time going down to the Keys, preaching down there. He, uh, Joseph, got to play his trumpet and he also preached to the children's church, the junior church, and he got to watch his dad uh, tip a kayak over in a bay. And uh, so there's a lot of good memories and wonderful things with that, uh, but it was good. I wanted to mention uh, several items on the back that can be a help to you. And we don't have a lot of stuff there, but uh, uh, most of it you can find at the Bill Rice Ranch. And one of them is a daily devotion by Evangelist Will Rice. I know, I'm sure Dr. Bill mentioned it when he was here. 365 daily devotions, fantastic uh, supplement to your devotional time. 
and I re highly recommend it. Um, he really is, Brother Will has the best devotions written in today's time, and uh, that's just my opinion. I say it very clearly. It's not mine, it's his, so I can uh, highly recommend it. Uh, then another great resource is Soul Winner's Fire by John o. Rice, and uh, it was his actually his first book to ever mm -hmm. write, his first one. I remember listening to cassette tapes of John o. Rice preach. Remember cassette tapes? Yes. <laughs> Kids have no clue what I'm talking about. And uh, so I would listen to cassette tapes. I was single for about a year, and uh, when I started in the ministry in '94, and I was traveling, and I would put in his messages. And then I'd have to stop the car because just streams of tears would come down my cheeks because of the passion he would have for souls and the compassion for the lost. And so it would, if there's a spark of a desire to see people say this book will fan it into a flame, it'll grow that desire. But uh, I really would encourage each one of you to take advantage of this next one. And it's uh, our DVD, uh, it's Will I See You in Heaven. God played it stood upon my heart to be able to put the gospel in DVD or video format. And uh, we use this as an outreach, we pass it out in New York City. And uh, we uh, be able to pass it, I pass it out several times, it's just even this weekend. And uh, as we meet people, uh, I pass it out a little more freely, uh, but I would encourage you not to pass it out like a track, but if you know someone uh, that you're burdened for and you've invited them to church and they've never come. Have you ever invited someone to church and they've never come? Yes. Have you ever invited someone to church? Uh, you can probably raise your hand on the next one, right? So maybe you, you have a relative that you're burdened for, but you haven't been able to give them the gospel. Uh, this, in under nine minutes, presents the gospel. And there's four different people that share their testimony. One's a Hindu lady that trusted Christ as Savior in our meetings. Another is my neighbor, who I thought could never get saved. One of those hard, rough kind of individuals that you'd find, oh, let's say, in Fort Lauderdale, perhaps. And uh, just a, a great story of God's grace. And then a couple other men as well. Uh, and so it says, can 10 minutes really change your eternal destiny? Real stories, real people, real change. See how real people, after accepting God's gift of eternal life, experience change in their lives and in their eternal destinies. And if you flip the, the flap open, there's a QR code there, and all the young people know what to do with that. It's a, uh, they scan it with their phone, and they can watch it on their device. And uh, if you get this, uh, we also would love for you to be able to share it on Facebook. You could send the link and share the video free online as well. Uh, we want to get the message out there. So uh, one is five dollars, but if you, um, we'd love to give it to you if you sign up for our email newsletter, and uh, it would just be our gift to you. And this would also provide us to be able the opportunity to be able to put our ministry in front of you, where you can pray for us. And uh, we do that every month. Uh, is our, our email newsletter. So that's the Will I See in Heaven. If you're interested in getting a pack, uh, then they're, they're discounted. They're not that much. They're not as much as $5 a piece. So I hope uh, you'll take advantage of that. At least get the free item. Free is good. Okay, free is a real good deal. I always like free stuff, don't you? All right, if you have your Bibles, let's uh, open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. I believe God is doing a work, and I believe we can be a part of it. And in the midst of doing a work and striving for the Lord and seeing great victories, there's opposition, there's problems, there's troubles, there's challenges, there's distresses, there's tribulations. There's these things that come upon us because Satan doesn't want us to go forward. But we've got that promise from Matthew where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, God's work will always get accomplished, but Satan wants to stop it. Well, here is the opportunity for God to work again in Exodus chapter 14 and the lives of the children of Israel. They've come out of Egypt. They're now up to the Red Sea. They're boxed in geographically. And who's coming behind them? They can see the chariots. They can see the dust rising up. And they can see Pharaoh leading the surge. And they're coming hard against them. And they're in a difficult situation. They have opposition. They have problems. What's their strategy? What's their strategy? Would you stand with me out of respect to God's word as we read Exodus 14, 
verses 13 and 14. Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. The Bible says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. The title of the message is The Strategies for the Battles of Life. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, I pray that you implement the spiritual strategies that you have for us like you did for Israel. Lord, I pray, would you give me strength? I am resting upon you. I need you desperately. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to be a vessel and a channel from which your life can flow and help me to accurately uh, communicate your word. Lord, I pray encourage hearts and challenge us and convict us, Lord. I pray you do your work in our hearts and our lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Well, here are the children of Israel, and they are certainly facing a difficult situation. And the Pharaoh leading his chariots are coming and pursuing hard against them. And now they're going to try to figure out, what are we going to do? As a man, especially, wouldn't you want to figure out, what are we going to do? Here's a problem. Here's a situation. Here's the battle ensuing. What is our battle plan? And we're going to see tonight that God's spiritual battle plan for us is not our natural human tendency. It's not going to be our natural battle plans. We're going to take this. We're going to do this. We're going to manipulate this. We're going to strategize over here. We're going to try a little bit harder over here. But God says, nah, -uh. nope. Moses tells him, uh, the people, three different strategies, and we're going to look at these tonight. Strategy number one. Look, if you will, in verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. Strategy number one, stand still. <laughs> stand still. Here's the battle coming. Here's the enemy pursuing. Okay, what do we do? Or do we get some swords? Do we grab some sticks? Do we uh, get some stones? Okay, what do we do, Moses? Okay, you ready? Stand still. Now, that's probably not the best strategy uh, of any general uh, that's four-star in our uh, military, is it? <laughs> We're just going to stand still and do nothing? Well, it's not, not, it's not do nothing, but it is stand still. Why is it that they would stand still? Well, the main reason you stand still is found in verse 14. It says, the Lord shall what for you? What? Fight, fight for you. The Lord shall fight for you. If it's God's battles, then you don't have to fight it. I'm thinking of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Oh, what a great passage. It's been tremendously helpful for me. When Jehoshaphat is getting attacked by a coalition of forces, and God says, says through the prophet, he answers his prayer, and he says, go out tomorrow, the Lord will be with you. He says again, stand ye still, see the salvation of the Lord. It's almost similar, very, very similar to this passage. And it says, and the Lord shall fight for you. It says this, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Did you realize that? Did you hear that? The battle is not yours, but God's. The spiritual battles that you're in, the temptation that you're in, the difficulties that you face in your life, these battles, watch this, are not yours. So if they're not yours, do you need to fight your bat uh, someone else's battles? No. No. Uh, I remember growing up in the east side of Indianapolis. Now, I'm sure uh, from not far from here, you could probably find some bad neighborhoods, right? Or some place that might be a little bit rougher than other places. Sure. Well, the east side was one of those places. If we go back to visit now, um, my wife will scramble to get to the door locks, you know, and she's locking the doors. Everybody lock the door. Everybody stay in the car, you know, because she's scared to death. I don't know why. We only had our car stolen once in front of our house. We only got uh, mugged one time, and we only got our house broken into twice. But other than that, we were fine, and it was a fine neighborhood with uh, multiple fights. And uh, so sometimes we'd go out in the neighborhood and I remember as a teenager, I see some teenagers getting in a fight. Now, I was skinny as a rail as a teenager, 
And uh, so I didn't pick any fights, let me tell you this. And uh, here's two teenagers, bigger than me, which wasn't difficult to do, and they're fighting. And it wasn't much of a fight because you really didn't land it too many punches. Uh, but the, at least they were getting into it. You know what I did not do? Jump in between two, na two teenagers that I did not know. I did not know why they were fighting and that were bigger than me. <laughs> I'm not going to get slugged. I'm not going to get worked over. No way. It wasn't my fight. Folks, if you could realize this, the battles in my life and the challenges in my life are mostly spiritual in nature and in the source. And the battles I'm facing are not mine. They're God's. So let God do the fighting for you. Stop it. Stand still. Stop strategizing. Stop trying to figure out how you can manipulate the situation. Stop it and just stand still. But not only do you stand still because God will fight for you, but you stand still to recognize the presence of God. You stand still to recognize the presence of God. He said, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. God's going to be with you. God's going to fight with you and fight for you. Let's take our Bibles. Hold your place in Exodus 14. Are you with me? And uh, find Psalm 46. Psalm 46. Psalm 46 is an excellent psalm, and I highly uh, recommend it. By the way, I appreciate the psalm that was quoted tonight, too. That was great, encouraging. Psalm 46, and this, if any psalm, was my psalm for 2016. What a tremendous help. Psalm 46. You stand still, why? So you can recognize the presence of God in the middle of your battle. If you have Psalm 46, would you say amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, if the person beside you is asleep, you can help with it. I'll let you do that. Okay, Psalm 46, you have it? It says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very what? Present, Present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried away in the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make the glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Watch this. God is in the midst of her. They were in the midst of problems, but God was in the midst of them. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Look at verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. And then it climaxes in verse 10. Skip to verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. You want the strategy for the Christian life? Be still and know that I am God. Why? Because in the midst of all this, here's all this, because it says the waters are moving around, the earth's being taken out from underneath them, the mountains are moving. They say, we're not going to fear because God's with us. In the midst of all of our problems, we recognize God's presence, and that's enough for us. Are you recognizing God's problem, presence? And the problem is typically this, is you're not being still. You're watching TV, you're listening to the radio, you're in traffic, you're going to job, uh, you're going through your agenda, you're making to-do list, you're checking Facebook, you're going on your di digital device, the first thing you get up in the morning, last thing you do it in, in the evening, does this sound familiar? You have the TV on, Fox News, whatever's news, this news, that news, all this noise, all this clutter. Just stop. Be still. And this is intentional. It's not passivity. It's not... I'm not doing, I'm doing nothing. No, no, no. You know what I was challenged to do is take 10 minutes before I start my devotions, stop. Don't pray, don't read, don't talk, don't move, just be still and do one thing, recognize God's presence. And I tell you, it totally changed my devotional life. And man, the first time I thought, okay, 10 minutes, I can do this, all right, okay, be still. Thumbs moving, legs bouncing. <laughs> okay, okay, be still. All right. I can do this. All right. 
I wonder how long it's gone by. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> you know, and some of you men out there just got to be still. And as soon as you be still, I'm going to fall asleep like you're doing now. <laughs> and, uh, and you know what? You just need to, okay, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to turn on the lights in this room, get a room that's quiet, have all the lights uh, turned on, drink a glass of water before you start, and sit there, not like this, but sit there and be still and start to recognize God's presence before you even start your devotions. Will you do that? Have a time where you're being still consciously. It's intentional faith to stop and say, God, I'm going through a hard time right now, but what I need right now is to know your presence with me. I remember one time I was uh, had a job where I had to go door to door in a, a downtown area. And across the street was this dog, and there's a big dog. It's like a Rottweiler. And it was coming towards me. Woof, woof, and it's just barking, and it's just coming right towards me. And what is the main thing you're not supposed to do when a dog is coming at you? You're not supposed to run. run. So you don't want to do this. You do that, and the chase is on. I mean, he's, you're the, you were the prey, and he is the hunter, and he's going to eat you. Okay, so don't run. So I knew I needed to stand my ground. Was that passivity? Oh, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to stand here. No, no, no. I stood my ground. I did the wrong big stance. And I pointed at him, and I yelled as loud as I could. And what did he do? He stopped right in his tracks. And he stopped right there. I'm going, I'm so glad I did, because on the inside, I'm scared to death. <laughs> and on the outside, I'm acting big and bold and mean. And he stopped. You want to know what I yelled? This is great. This is no lie. I was looking at him. I'm thinking, how am I going to call for someone else to come to my aid and be able to scare the dog at the same time? So I stood my ground, I pointed my finger at him, and I yelled, help! That's exactly what I yelled. <laughs> Could you imagine? You're, you're eating supper at your table, you know, you're, all of a sudden you hear, help! You know, like the strongest call for help you've ever heard. I am very confused, so is the dog. <laughs> but he at least left me alone. You know what, this is not, oh, you know, I'm just doing, I'm being lazy. No, no, this is the difference between a, being a Martha and a Mary intentionally sitting at Jesus' feet and recognize His presence. Are you doing that? Number one strategy, stand still and recognize the presence of God. Number two strategy, see your salvation. See your salvation. Now, this is important. Let's look back in our text of Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13. See your salvation. Why do you see it? This is all about your perspective. That we're seeing our salvation so we can change our perspective. Uh, look, if you would, at verse 13. Exodus 14, verse 13. It says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still. Here it is. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. Now watch this. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Why is he saying this so much with his sight? So he can display right in front of them and show them, and so they can change their total whole perspective. And what they're doing is now they're not seeing their problem as something that's overwhelming, but their problem is actually an opportunity for God to provide for them and to deliver them. Look, if you would, at verse 10. Um, in fact, yeah, let's, let's start right there. Verse 10, it says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, and the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, here they, they saw him, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So they're crying out because they're seeing the Egyptians. They see them coming. What's going on here? You know what? They need to have, change your perspective. First of all, they need a high perspective. They need a higher perspective. You need a higher perspective on your problems. What is God's perspective, not your own? Look, if you would, at verse 4 to see the higher perspective. In the verse 4, it says this. Here is God speaking. He says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them. Whoa! Did God know that Pharaoh was going to come after him? Yes or no? Yes! yes. No. Did God allow this? Yes. I would almost even want to ask, did God plan it? Sure. Wow! He said that he shall follow after them. And then it says, watch. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh. 
and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. You know what God is doing? He is doing it so he can get honor. Verse 18, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh. He knew exactly that they are going to come. He knew the problem was coming. And God knows the problems that's in your life as well. What we need to do is change your perspective. But here's our perspective. It's down here. It's low. We're down in the valley like we're down with the Egyptians. I'm sorry, the Israelites. When they're looking at the Egyptians, they see chariots. They see swords. They see spears. They see Pharaoh and his anger. We are toast. He's going to get us. That's the wrong perspective. That's a, just this low perspective. They need to get up here, soar like evils, and get a high perspective. It's like getting in a plane on a rainy, cloudy day, and you go up above the clouds to get a high perspective. It's like hiking through a, a cavern or a valley, and you're going through the trails, and you're going higher and higher until you get to the top of the mountain. What happens? Your vista totally changes and your perspective changes because now you're higher and you can see so much more. When we get to the high perspective, we see our problems like God sees our problems. And they're opportunities for God to deliver us. What would happen if we started to change our perspective on our problems and say, Hey, I got another unexpected bill. <laughs> another opportunity for God to work. Hey, we have somewhat of an emergency fund, right? And, but we didn't have enough plan for that car problem. Another opportunity for God to work. Man, we've got family issues and relationship problems, and here's our trying to reach our relatives, and they're, they're closing us out. Oh, it's just so hard. Another opportunity for God to deliver and show himself strong. Would you change your perspective and get a high perspective? When you do that, the result's going to be a hopeful perspective. A higher perspective results in a hopeful perspective. We don't have time to see it, but in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, it talks about our tribulation, our troubles, work with patience and patience, experience and experience, hope. Hope isn't, I wish this is going to take place. Hope is a certainty that God will provide in the future. It's a faith with certainty that God will do that thing. I remember, um, I read that passage the morning after I got our trailer stuck in the septic tank. <laughs> Six hours of pulling the thing and tugging on the thing. It was literally, it was like this. We went into the trailer and it was like a tilty world. The refrigerator was like this. Doors open, food's falling out. I'm trying to shove it and close it and everything. And it's in there. My wife said, hey, I have some food I need to put in. I said, no, 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 you can't get in it. And because it was so much of an angle that we thought the, the uh, tow truck driver said, we we're going to have to get a second tow truck because we don't want this thing tipping over. And we, don't, we own no house. Our house has wheels on it. We think people that own houses that don't move are weird. And uh, so we have a house that moves. Uh, it's great. If you don't like your neighbors, you just leave. And so, uh, so we always have, we have a house with wheels on it. Not be a little silly, but I'm serious. We have no home. That's it. All, I'm looking at this trailer. It's like this. And the, the tow truck driver says, we're going to have to get another truck so it doesn't tip over. And we're like, 90% of all our earthly belongings right here. And it's going to go, <laughs> destroy it. God got us through it. And oh, man, it was intense. It was the most intense trailer situation I've ever been through. I wish I could. It takes like 15 minutes to tell the whole story, so I can't do it. It's incredible. You know what? The next morning, I open up Romans 5, 3 through 5. Tribulations, what's the end result? Hope. Now, I wasn't like, man, that's so terrible. Oh, this is, a, man, this is, you know, we thought we lost our gas lines. We thought we lost our sewage lines, water lines. We had thousands of dollars worth of damage ended up our damage was under our thousand uh, dollar deductible it's incredible water was intact sewer was intact gas lines intact 
It was totally God. You know what it did? It provided help and hope that God, you got me through this one, you're going to get me through the next one. Right. And you know what? Would I do it again, get stuck in a septic tank? Well, I would if, in that particular time, as a result, during that meeting, we had 18 people trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Hmm. Yeah, I'd do it again. I don't want to. <laughs> but if we get 18 people saved, okay, Lord, I'm trusting you. What are we saying here? We're saying get a spiritual strategy that's totally different and unnatural for us. Number one, stand still and recognize God's presence. Number two, see your salvation and change your perspective on your problems. And number three, is silence your speech. Number three, okay. silence your speech. Look at verse 14. It says, the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold ye your peace. Hold your peace. I looked up that Hebrew word there. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I took no Hebrew whatsoever, but I can look it up. And I looked it up, and it means silence. And it means quiet. And it means cease from speaking. It means the word that I can't say out loud. But you're supposed to when you're just, climate. <laughs> Stop speaking. Silent. It, this is sign language for it. Are you ready? <laughs> you kind of get the idea. Shoop, zip your lip. What are they doing? Doing? They're seeing the problem and they go, "Oh Moses, what are we gonna do? Oh man!" They start complaining to him. How many times did they say this? Verse 11. They said unto Moses, "Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us out to die in the wilderness?" Same old song. <laughs> I mean, they're going to say this thing so many times. They're complaining. They're belly aching. And they're telling other people instead of going to God. You know what? Sometimes in our problems, in our situations, what God wants us to do, stop talking about it to others and talk to Him about it. Amen. God wants you to pray. And God delights in answering your prayers, not your Sunday school classes alone, not your church as a whole. I'm talking about yours. Yeah. Your kid here, your wife here, your single here, your man, your woman, it does not matter. God wants to answer your prayers. Well, I really want Pastor to pray for mm -hmm. this. Okay, there's times when we we mention prayer. And listen, if I had a child of mine in intensive care in a hospital. Do you think I've mentioned to people? You better believe it. You think I tell my pastor in our church? You better believe it. Yes. There's certain times, definitely share that request. Let's enter in together and pray for that need and that burden. But there's times I know I'm talking about it more than I'm praying about it. And there's times when I've been guilty of saying it well, would you pray for this so someone else could help me out? Have you ever been in a situation where you're hearing the, you know, someone saying, well, would you pray for me? Um, you know, I need money to be able to pay for my uh, cable bill. No, I will not pray for your cable bill. <laughs> and uh, I'm being silly with that. But what are they doing? Yeah, they're not asking God, they're asking. Have you ever done that? Okay. Now, can we mention prayer requests? Yeah. Can we mention them publicly? Yes. But there's come a time when we need to say, Okay, Lord, I'm going to come to you and trust you alone that you will answer this request, that you will do this thing. Um, is it possible that God wants to speak to you? Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6. Can we turn there? That'll be our last verse to look at. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6. Matthew 6, 6. Jesus is talking about secret giving, secret fasting, and secret prayer. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 6. It says this. Matthew 6 and verse 6. You have it? If you have it, just say amen. amen. Okay. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, 
And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. God wants to answer your prayer in secret. That you didn't mention to anyone else. But you just took to God. And you asked Him for help. And you're depending upon Him and Him alone. That's what God wants to do for you. Hey, maybe there's a time when you can be able to post it on Facebook or tweet about it. But then there's certain times you shouldn't. And you know, doing that, I'm just talking about it. I'm not really praying about it, my own self, and in, the, in a serious fashion. Take it to God. I remember I was uh, going out to our truck one time that was pulling our, pulled our trailer years ago. And I tried to start it. It was cold, cold out and it wouldn't start. Man, trying to start it, wouldn't start. And uh, I was praying, Lord, would you please help our truck to start? And God convicted me because I know we needed a new truck. <laughs> and not just to pray for this one to be fixed and repaired again. We travel all across the nation. And it's not like we just stay in one city or one state. We're all over. So we needed a pinnacle vehicle. So I prayed that the Lord would provide for us. And I believe, according to Mark chapter 11, verse 24, the promise that God gave me, that God heard my prayer, that God was going to provide for us a new vehicle. That night, I, I knew God heard my prayer that night. Well, the next morning, when I walked out of my trailer, I walked down the steps. You know what I saw in the parking lot? The same bro broken down old truck. <laughs> it was still there, but you know what? I knew God had heard my prayer. I thought, well, I know what, what I'll do is I'll send out a, a prayer letter. And uh, I'll say, would you pray for us with this new vehicle need? And would you consider giving? Just be up front, you know. And God said, no. Do you believe that I answered your prayer? And then just trust me. Well, maybe I can at least make a phone call. It's like maybe just a handful of people <laughs> and pastors and churches, you know? Just say, hey, would you pray about this and, and consider giving? And God said, no. Do you believe I answered your prayer that you did in secret? No one else was around? Could then trust me. Whoa, 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 no. Just mention it maybe in this church? No. Didn't mention it. Um, we had no large gift given. But over the next several months, it was amazing how God provided for us and answered our request. One time I was driving down the road, we're driving to our next meeting, I got a call from a guy, and he said, Hey, Brother Miller, how you doing? I said, Doing good. He said, I haven't talked to you in months, years, probably. Um, God just placed you and your ministry on our heart for some reason. What's going on? I said, well, Lord, he asks, so I'm going to tell him. And so I told him. And he said, okay, thanks. And he said, hung up, sent a check for $800. Wow. Incredible. Church would take a special offering. Someone else would do something uh, unique. Maybe $100 here, $200 here. God provided all the money for our vehicle. And we got it, and we're dri dri driving it back home. And all the kids come running out of our trailer. And they say, look, look, hey, there's the truck that God provided for us. He did it. I remember months later, we're driving down the road in our new vehicle that God answered for us. And we're talking about a missionary that needed a new vehicle. And the kids are in the back, and one of them says, well, what's that? What do they need? And I said, they need a new vehicle. And they say, well, that's easy. <laughs> Why don't they just ask God for it? Folks, what's your problem? What's your need? What's your challenge? What's your request? That's easy. Why don't you just ask God for it? Not man. Take it to God. What do you need to do tonight? You need to stand still and recognize God's presence. Do you need to see the salvation of the Lord and change your perspective on your problems and be hopeful and not cynical? Do you need tonight to say, Lord, I need to silence my speech to others and take all my cares to you and bring my request to you and pray to you in secret. What do you need to do tonight? Father, I ask for your help. Would you please give it? Help us to respond in obedience to you in this uh, service here right now. With heads bowed,
with eyes closed, let me just ask, did God speak to you? You say, Brother Miller, I'm saved. I know that I'm on my way to heaven, but God spoke to my heart. Maybe I need to stand still. I haven't been recognizing God's presence in my daily walk with Him like I should. Maybe for me, I need to change my perspective, stop complaining about my problems, and see them as opportunities where God can deliver me and help me again. Or maybe for me, it's the last one. I need to stop talking about it to others and start really praying to God. God's spoken to me about using one of these spiritual strategies in facing my problems. If that's you, can you raise your hand? God's spoken to me. God bless you and you and you and you. God bless you and you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can place your hands down. Would you look this way? Let's just do this. Let's respond to the Lord. And we'll stand. I'll pray. And when we finish, I finish praying, just find a place to pray. Maybe it's right there and you can have a seat. Maybe it's just right out here at the front. Just find a place and ask the Lord to help with what he spoke to your heart about tonight. Would you do that? Everyone standing, let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for encouraging our hearts, strengthening our faith. And Lord, thank you for several making decisions tonight. Lord, I pray you'd speak to their hearts and help in a very special way, I ask. Give grace in each of these steps of faith, I ask in Jesus' name. With heads bowed, with eyes closed, would you just find a place and pray just right now in the quietness? Would you just find a place? Just have a seat or just kneel, whatever is more comfortable. And you just pray and ask the Lord to help in that decision. Good. God bless you. Just take a moment and pray. When you're finished, you can stand back up. We'll know that you're done. Others are just having a seat or just bowing and just taking time. Just take your mo that moment, that quietness, and pray about it. Give another moment or so. Others are still praying. Let's finish with the word of prayer together, shall we? Father, thank you for teaching us these lessons and sharing it with our hearts and our minds what you did with Israel. Now, Lord, we can get a different perspective as we look back at history and Israel, how you delivered them time and time again. Help us to see by faith as we look forward and all the obstacles and the challenges that will be in our life to see with hope that you will deliver us. And God, throughout the midst of the problems, Lord, would you be with the, in, in our midst and uh, help us to recognize your presence. Lord, encourage our hearts, strengthen us, and help us, I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Pastor, would you come and close us how you see fit? Well, we thank the Lord for the message. Thank you for being God's messenger. Certainly appreciate it. I hope you get to know uh, Evangelist Miller just a little bit. And he's one that is part of a ministry that actually shares with our burden. Cumberland Hills Baptist Church uh, this January actually began supporting church planting uh, through this ministry. We're so thankful for that. And so uh, tell him tell him uh, great things so he can go back and tell his church about it. So <laughs> I'm kidding about it. But uh, please do greet your church for us and, and express our gratitude. And we certainly do thank you for being here. Folks, you're dismissed. <laughs>